everyone. Hi. Uh, you ready for the last set of talks? Woo. Sure. Yeah, why not? Cool. Hi. Uh, I'm Sam. I'm also known as Snugug throughout the internet. Uh, this is the Houdini Bunny. If you want Houdini Bunny stickers, come find me. I have a bunch of them. Uh, and this talk is available online at that link. Don't worry, that link will be up again at the end of the talk. So, what is Houdini? For those of you who haven't uh, been following a web standard that doesn't really exist in any browsers yet. Uh, well, the objective of the CSS Tag Houdini Task Force, uh, or CSS Houdini, is to jointly develop features that explain the magic of styling and layout on the web. Practically, though, what does that mean? Well, it means extending CSS via JavaScript so that authors, like us, don't have to wait decades for browsers and standards bodies to implement new things. But wait, you say, can't we do that already? And the answer is not quite. It's not currently possible to extend CSS through JavaScript. It's only possible to mimic jo or write JavaScript that mimics CSS. Actually, polyfilling CSS or introducing new features like CSS Grid is hard to impossible to do today, especially so without being just terrible for performance. Houdini will actually let authors tap into the actual CSS engine, finally letting them extend CSS and do so at CSS engine speeds. I like to think about it like this. Much like service workers are a low-level JavaScript API for the browser's cache, Houdini introduces low-level JavaScript APIs for the browser's render engines. And I think that's pretty cool. So the question that I always get is, can I use it yet? And the answer is unequivocally no. No, you cannot use it yet. But I mean, maybe kind of? Uh, things are coming. The web is changing a little bit. So maybe kind of. So normally it's a warning. Today it's a heads up. Some of Houdini is getting pretty stable, and you can kind of start to use it in some browsers, but some of it, a lot of it, is pretty far off. And the landscape's, like I said, really in flux. Most of what we're going to be talking about today is the mostly stable bit, but you're going to need to use polyfills and get your progressive enhancement on in order to use this stuff today. So let's talk about the core magical secrets of Houdini, the stuff that you need to understand to make everything else work. And the first one is this thing called worklets. Worklets are extension points for render engines. They're kind of like web workers, but they're much smaller in scope. They can be parallelized. They live on multiple threads. And most importantly, you don't call them. The render engine calls them. They're an extension of the render engine. So this is what adding one looks like. You have a demo worklet, an add module, and then a path to whatever your worklet is. These are also promises, so you can promise all of them and then off of them to do work once your worklets are loaded. Every worklet has this kind of shape to it. It's got a function. That function is the function that gets called. Uh, that function has a name, which is the thing you're actually going to use in CSS. And then there's a class. And the all classes will have some sort of process function, which is the actual thing the render engine is calling whenever it wants to use your worklet. You'll see a couple examples of this later on. Let's take a look at the life cycle of a worklet. We have our render engine. Our render engine spins up the main thread. Once it's spun up the main thread, it'll also spin up multiple worklet processes. These worklet processes can either be on the main thread or they can be parallel to the main thread. It doesn't matter. There's just going to be a bunch of them sitting around. From the main thread, we're going to call our browser JavaScript, and our browser JavaScript is going to call worklet add module. That's going to load a worklet and the worklet will load into two or more worklet processes. Now, here's where things get interesting. Instead of our browser JavaScript calling our worklet, the render engine calls our worklet when it needs to do a render, or when it needs to use it. Worklets are the underlying foundation for which all of Houdini is based. They're the magic that makes it happen. It's what makes Houdini powerful. Next bit, typed OM. The typed OM exposes structure beyond simple strings, which is what we have today, for CSS values. These can be manipulated and retrieved really performantly, and they're part of this new CSS style value class. And there are a bunch of different options. There's keyword values like idents, there's position values, transform values, unit values, and some math. 
So this is what it looks like. We've got a class of example with a background position of center, bottom, 10 pixels. Now, trying to parse that out from that string is really hard, but with uh, the typed OM, we can get its computed map si or computed style map, and then we can get background position dot x, and that comes back as a CSS unit value with a value of 50, and a unit of percentage or percent. Background position y, it's a sum of 100% because that's bottom, that's going to the bottom, and then negative 10 pixels because that's what that bottom 10 pixels bit means in CSS. So we no, no, no longer need to string parse this and do disgusting reg regex to actually understand what this is. We can just call it and get it. Typed OM gives us the structure we need to cast the spells that we want. But what can you do with this, you might say? Well, you can do some pretty rad things. Let's talk about the rad custom stuff that you can do with worklets and the typed OM. Please allow me to introduce or reintroduce you to window.css. And the first API we're going to look at is the properties and values API, aka make the snozberries taste like snozberries. So this is kind of the current state of custom properties or CSS variables. We have something called my color. We set it to green, and then we set it to a URL that's not a color, and everything is sad because URL is not a color, and it doesn't know what to do. But then we can do window.css.register property, tell it the property my color has a syntax of color, and now the browser knows it's a color. Because the browser knows it's a color, that URL junk is going to get skipped which is really nice. There are a couple other things we can do with it. We can decide whether or not it inherits up the DOM, but we can also give it an initial value. Boop, there we go. There are a bunch of different types that you can use with syntax. So you can create lengths, you can create numbers, percentages, images, colors, times, resolutions, all sorts of different types for this syntax. And you can combine them. So a single item is just a single item length. You can combine them with a bar separator for an or. So in this case, it's an image or a URL. If you have custom idents, you can combine a bunch of them. So big, bigger, and all caps bigger are three different valid idents. If you have a plus, that's a space separated list. So in this case, a space separated list of lengths. And then if you have a hash, it's a comma separated list. Now. Now that a browser actually knows what it is, we can do some pretty interesting things. So we have over here a two buttons uh, styled with a linear gradient and a custom property. Now, if I hover over the unregistered one, it does exactly what we think it does, nothing. It just pops into that next color because we can't transition linear gradients, right? Well, now that we know what a custom property is, now that we know that it's a color, if we transition the custom property, then ooh, we can actually do things like transition linear gradients or transition anything that is a registered custom property. And that gets really powerful, as you'll see as we go along. But before we do that, how can we use them in your design systems? That's the point of this talk, right? How can we use Houdini in design systems? Well, there is a proposed declarative syntax uh, for these custom properties that lets you write these custom properties not in JavaScript, but in CSS, using at property, property name, and then the syntax. And it roughly works out to the JavaScript on the left or on the right. What's nice about this proposed syntax is you can start using it today with a post CSS plugin. A post CSS plugin, you write that property syntax, and it will spit out the JavaScript. So you can write all your custom properties in your CSS, deliver them as part of your design systems, as well as the JavaScript for a fallback, which then is progressively enhanced with the if statement. So some things we can do with this. We can make CSS variables smarter. So if we've got our main blue, and we have a property main blue with uh, syntax inherits an initial value, we can use that. And in fact, when the property syntax ships, we can get rid of that initial main blue uh, call entirely because it'll just be there available. We can also make things like this background variable more intelligent by only allowing images or colors and not allowing it to inherit up the DOM. Right now, all CSS variables inherit up the DOM, which is not something you really want for a background. 
But what's really cool when we start to talk about worklets is you can make truly custom properties. So you can do things like theme colors, where you have idents for theme colors that you want to allow. You can do things like create custom columns for layouts. You can create your own padding uh, properties. So all these different uh, actual literal custom properties as opposed to just placeholders for things you're going to put into another property somewhere else. Speaking of worklets, let's talk about the Paint API, because as Bob Ross likes to say, every day is a good day when you paint. Yeah, Bob Ross. Uh, have you ever wanted to use Canvas as a background, a mask, or a border in CSS? With the styling and flexibility of an element and the scalability of an SVG? Of course you haven't. No one has. But it turns out if you can do that, it's actually really cool, and you can do a lot of really interesting things. So the Paint API, the class for the worklet looks a little bit something like this. We have input properties. That's an array of properties, either custom properties or standard properties. You can read standard properties into uh, that you want to read in from the element that this is, that's being painted. You can also pass input arguments with that same formatting syntax as custom properties to pass in arguments to the paint function. And then the paint function is the thing that actually gets called. It has a 2D drawing context, the size of the element, the properties that get passed in, and the arguments. Let's write a basic paint worklet right now. So this one's just going to draw a big circle. We're going to get the circle color property. We're going to uh, get it from within our paint function, and this is actually a CSS style value. This is our typed OM in action. Then we do some math to figure out the center point and the radius of our circle, and we draw our circle. Once we've drawn our circle, we import it, and we get this. I mean, I've, I've drawn a big circle in the, middle, in the middle of the thing. I can change its color. It's nice. It's a, it's a cute little circle demo. But with this as our foundation, we can do really interesting things. So there's this guy named Tim Holman, and he makes great generative art. So I've converted one of his generative art demos into an actual paint background using this. So I can decide how many steps that I want. I start with 50, but if I do 40, and I, every time I reload the page, it randomly generates a new background image for me. I do this with very few lines of CSS. Uh, I don't need to load a new image in, and it's all controllable through actual CSS. The worklet isn't so big, it's smaller than loading an image, and you can get an infinite number of randomly generated backgrounds this way, uh, much more interesting and much more performant than just loading in a bunch of random images. You can even combine the paint worklet with uh, that custom property transition, and you can do something like this and create a nice little ripple effect by figuring out where you clicked and then toggling on a class that has uh, the end transition state that you want and transitioning through our paint. Cool. How can I use this in design systems? Well, there's a polyfill for it. And it works pretty well anywhere that has Canvas, and you're going to want CSS variables as well. It especially works pretty well in Firefox and Safari. When I think design systems, I think web components, or I think components. And when I write components, I think web components. I've been using them recently. I really like them. And I think that they're a great way to encapsulate styling and functionality. Uh, and we're going to use it today to build our, uh, our version of a paint button, although buttons aren't as cool as what we're going to build. So we have this basic demo of tabs. We have a tab. You switch tabs. Everything switches hunky-dory, except these tabs have that cute little rounded corner going out at the bottom, which, if you've ever tried to actually do, uh, is not so straightforward, especially if you want it stylable through CSS uh, and without any extra elements. So what we're going to do is we're going to write a paint function, a paint worklet, that will write those for us and style it based off of the background color of our tab. So starting with a web component, you start by writing a template. A template has an ID. It has our styling. The styling lives inside of our template and is only going to affect this web component. It won't leak outside. We've got a couple uh, variables up top, CSS variables, where we're using a property we're passing in called tab multiplier to do some math for us to make sure that 
our bottom rounded corners and our top rounded corners all kind of continue to, uh, to be in sync with each other. And then we do some of the actual a little bit annoying CSS to get border images working uh, with paint. And then we're good with our styling. For our HTML, this is pretty basic. It's a div. Uh, and we have this part, uh, L or part attribute on it to allow us to expose styling outside of our web component. This is part of the new uh, shadow parts spec for web components. The JavaScript for getting this to actually work and be usable is very straightforward. On the left, we've got our CSS paint registrations, or sorry, property registrations, and we're adding our worklet for our paint module, or paint worklet. And then on the right is all the JavaScript I need to turn that template into a reusable web component. I extend the HTML element, I grab the content of that template and attach it to the shadow DOM, and then under custom elements, I define a rounded tab using that class. It's six lines of JavaScript. It's not so terribly hard to do. And in the end, we get this, what we just saw. Tabs, tabs, tabs. But because we've encapsulated it, we can start to do things like make everything more round or even more round. And we get those nice rounded transitions from those tabs uh, dynamically through this CSS, controlled through our CSS. We can even do things like change the tab position. So if we look at our first tab, this is on the left, we could say instead we want it on the right and our rounded corner moves to the other end or the middle. And now it's on both. Go back to left. And because we're using paint, which can read in regular properties, I can change the background of this tab to something like purple, and it will change what I've painted as well. No extra elements, no extra loading of anything. This one paint worklet is able to do all of that with standard CSS backing it up. Now, the final thing we're going to talk about is the Layout API. And the Layout API is a little bit heavy, and it's super experimental, but it's kind of cool, so I'm going to show it to you anyway. Uh, the Paint API lets you play Tetris with your web apps. It literally lets you make your own display properties. It lets you do things like polyfill that awesome new layout spec that you like. Or because everyone likes a good masonry layout, you can write one without the performance hit of running a bunch of JavaScript on the main thread. Now, this spec's a little bit complicated, so I'm going to walk you through how the spec thinks about layout, which actually can help you understand how browsers think about layout. Layout starts with a box. A box is either an element or it is a pseudo element. The layout algorithm for that box is something called the current layout. The box's direct parent is the parent, the layout algorithm for the box's direct parent is the parent layout. The parent layout has layout constraints. Those layout constraints is the available room inside of the parent for the box to be laid out in. The parent layout also has layout edges. These are your box model edges, padding, scroll bar, and borders. Current layout has a child layout, which is the layout algorithm of layout child as if it wasn't visible with display none. I didn't name these things. I'm sorry they're named confusingly. Uh, bring it up in the spec. Now, layout child can't really do anything, but what it can do is it can generate a layout fragment. And layout fragments are interesting. Layout fragments have an inline size and a block size. This goes back to the abstract sizing stuff that we talked about, or that I think was mentioned earlier. So inline sizing and block sizing, this is stuff we can't change. We can't actually change the size of elements when we go to lay them out. But we can change their inline offset and block offset. That's how we actually position stuff around. Cool. With that out of the way, let's take a look at layout. We've got input properties. Uh, input properties are actually things that go on the parent layout. So uh, layout API, layout worklets, they start from the parent layout down as opposed to the current layout up. So input properties, these are things like uh, your grid template columns on display grid would be input properties. Child input properties are properties you want to read in from the children of that layout. So this would be uh, like grid columns. And then there are a couple layout options. There are two functions that get called as part of this. One is intrinsic sizing, or intrinsic size, which will figure out 
how much room a block should take up, uh, and layout, which is the actual function that we do our layout in. Now, the internals of intrinsic sizing are really complex, so we're not going to cover them. Uh, the easiest way to think about it is what you're trying to figure out here is, given an unlimited amount of space, how big can we make a box so there's not a lot of unused space? And then also, how small can we make that box without having any of the content overflow? And once we figure out how big it can possibly be and how small it can possibly be, then we return that and the browser figures out where it goes in between those two things. But the layout function, that's pretty easy to understand. The first thing we need to do is we need to figure out what the uh, total size is that we can lay out our children in. So that's our inline size minus our edge inline and our block size minus our block inline. Bundle that up as an object, and then we uh, loop through each one of the children and generate a fragment based on that constraint size. This is us generating layout constraints. From there, we start actually laying stuff out. We get the block offset, started at where our edges start, and then just loop over everything. We make its block offset whatever the block offset is, we center it, uh, and then we add to the block offset so we have an item go right one underneath each other. And finally, add block edges back in, and we return our children and this new block sizing. And we get something that looks like this. Again, not super duper terribly cool. It's just a whole bunch of boxes centered on one on top of another. But with this as our building block, we can do some really cool things, like build a layout that puts everything in a circle puts everything in a circle in 40 lines of JavaScript uh, for the worklet with no external dependencies at render engine speeds with as many elements as you want. That's 12, that's 18, up. Oh. Remind me later, I had disabled notifications. I'm glad that popped up. Um, so yeah, as many elements as we want and we can just kind of keep on going. But wait, there's more. A masonry layout, because everyone likes masonry. This masonry layout is literally 45 lines of JavaScript with no dependencies at render engine speeds. Uh, you can see it goes across one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. It's packing it all in there. If I go to my CSS, if I want columns, let's say I want five columns. Now, it's slow because the images are reloading every time, but I have a masonry layout with almost no overhead. And I can make it with no padding in between. Now I've got this nice, tight, dense grid. And that's something everyone loves. But I've got one more thing for you. Yeah, you can clap for masonry layout. I've got one last thing. How do we use this in our design systems? Well, masonry layout, we know how we use because we can lay out cards forever now. Uh, but how about this? This is a demo that kind of uses everything that we've shown. Transitioning custom properties, uh, typed OM, custom paint worklet, and that circular layout that I just showed you to create an animated, circular navigation or dial pad navigation without any JavaScript for any of the an animation, all powered by CSS. Now, the animation is going to be a little bit choppy because something happened in Chrome Canary and it got a little bit choppy since I last gave this, uh, but it looks pretty cool, I think, right? Now, it's not as cool when I do that. But if I do that again, yeah. So the paint worklet is animating uh, an offset, the offset property, and that's drawing that arc. And it's animating it based on our transition. Now, we can do some cool things with this because it's all CSS. If we do padding of zero, that'll stay the same. But when I close it, everything shrinks back in, right? Now, if I go really crazy, Offset, 495, 135. 
Wow. Now again, this is 15 maybe lines of JavaScript for the paint worklet. It's 40 lines of JavaScript for the circle layout worklet. And then everything else is just CSS and transitions because the browser knows, now knows what to do and we're extending CSS through JavaScript. And you know what? I think that's awesome. Because with Houdini, the future of our design systems and our styling is really bright. And we all really need to party for that because we get to add magic to our design systems. Thank you all very much. So again, uh, that's the link to the talks. Here's a bunch of other good resources. Houdini.glitch.me is an interactive introduction to Houdini that you can play with. Uh, you're going to need Chrome Canary with experimental flags on. Uh, and yeah, the source code for this talk is available too if you want to dig into all these demos. Thank you all.